is share the share that screen again. <clears throat> well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it is Tuesday, the thirteenth. Uh, Tuesday, April thirteenth. Uh, it is the Energy for Alaska Task Force meeting. Uh, it is 8.05 in the a.m. and our, oh, Charlie Brown, and our guest is Mr. Ian Lang. He is the executive director of uh, the Institute of the North, uh, for, established by uh, Governor Wally Hickel. Uh, and, but I'll, I'll go ahead and let Mr. Lang introduce himself in the organization. So, Mr. Lang, if you would like to commence, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Jemmo. I, for some reason, I just... This little thing we worked out right at the beginning is no longer working. Um, let me just start this here real quick. Give me one more second. I'm so sorry about this. It's okay, that's fine. While we have a moment, I'll just remind everybody, although you know the process and the protocols pretty well, as always, the chat line is open. I'll be monitoring it, uh, but you may also simply unmute and fire away. Now, I'm going to go ahead and mute everybody while we start. Um, but again, if you do have questions, uh, Ian's, Ian's been briefed. He, he knows he knows our group. Um, and so again, you can simply unmute yourself uh, if you have a question and, and, and launch. OK, you all set, sir? Well, I assume you're saying all of this stuff, not just the slide, right? Uh, no, I, all we see is, uh, well, all I see is resolving Alaska's fiscal challenge. I don't see any oh. notes or anything. Oh, great. Okay. Much ado about nothing. My apologies. All right. Well, thanks everybody for tuning in. I really appreciate you taking the time to hear from me. My name is Ian Lang, like Jumbo said, and I'm the executive director of the Institute of the North. And for anybody who is unfamiliar with the Institute, um, like Jumbo said, we're, um, we were formed by Governor Wally Hickel, but our mission is really focused on trying to ensure that we do the very most, get the most public benefit out of the resources that we share in common. And if that sounds vaguely familiar, it's because that language was lifted right out of the state constitution. So I like to think that we try to impart sort of a distinctly Alaska constitutionalist perspective on things. And I'm here today uh, because one of those great common resources, um, the permanent fund, is very much at risk today. And <clears throat> we are out promoting the idea, and I'm here to kind of pitch it to you, of a constitutional amendment which would protect the fund. And there are really two main ideas that I want you to leave with. The first, that this is an old idea. It is uh, and actually, Jumbo, you could probably attest to this. I have not, I can't think of a single more well-studied, thoroughly vetted, widely supported, but unimplemented concept in Alaska public policy today. Uh, it's been around forever. It has long been recognized as the cornerstone to Alaska's fiscal future. But it's more than that, because where we are with the spending of savings in this state we also regard it as the keystone to unlocking this larger fiscal challenge, uh, which in and of itself, I think we can all agree is the thing. It is the biggest number one priority. Nothing else is going to have such a substantial impact on what the future of this state looks like. So real quick, um, if you're not familiar with this idea, um, what we're promoting is the idea of a constitutional percent of market value amendment. And uh, all that would really do is to convert the permanent fund into a traditional endowment structure so that we limit spending to a certain percentage of the fund's value that we might call sustainable. Uh, it's often 5% uh, ish. Um, there are three versions of this bill out there. There's one in the House uh, that I'll be testifying on in a couple hours, and there are two in the Senate. Uh, but they all do essentially the same thing. They protect the asset value, and then they vary in other ways. Oh, Ian, you just locked up. I locked up? There you go. You uh, you were saying, uh, but they, they differ in some ways. Yeah, they, 
the thing that they all share is that they treat this fund as an endowment and limit spending to five-ish percentage of the fund's value. Uh, the main thing that differentiates these amendments is how they treat the dividend. One does not have any reference to the dividend. One uh, calls for a constitutional dividend, but does not dictate a formula. And the other one uh, dictates how that is spent by uh, allocating 50% of that percent of market value draw to dividends. And there's some other minor things I don't think are all that important at this point, but we can talk about those if you like later. Well, regarding, the, real the, quick, the, yeah. regarding the percent of market value concept, my recollection is that um, Governor Murkowski, all the way back then, um, <laughs> talked about uh, percent of market value payout from the fund. I know that the corporation has been advocating for this uh, kind of structure for, for quite a long time. Yeah. Yeah, the, the Permanent Fund Board of Trustees has put out four resolutions on it in 2000, uh, 2000, 2004, 2003, this year, but they're not an advocacy organization. So all they can really do is suggest that, hey, legislature, you should take a look at this because it's very important for the future. Um, and like you said, uh, Murkowski recommended it. Every major fiscal planning commission that has ever occurred in this state has recommended this. It was even supported by the fathers of the permanent fund itself immediately following passage of the original legislation. So like you said, it's been around for a long time. It just hasn't needed to pass until now. Now we are at that point. So a little more history for you. Uh, and this will be, uh, I think, uh, not news to most of you, but <clears throat> we've been in this situation for seven or eight years now. Um, the short uh, reason, of course, being that production's down, prices are down, costs are up, the net result being uh, oil revenues uh, have dramatically fallen. And since 2013, we've been essentially deficit spending at times uh, $4 for every dollar we bring in in revenue. And during that time, we've cut spending by 40%, <clears throat> largely eliminating capital investments in the state, uh, but trimming agency spending for most agencies to the lowest real level in a long, long time. And of course, we've spent $17 billion in non-permanent fund savings. And um, one other important thing happened, and I don't know that everybody appreciates the significance of this, but a few years ago, we enacted a statutory percent of market value formula, and we started spending from the permanent fund for the first time to support government services. And that really marked a very significant shift from a state that you know, we all recognize has been largely funded by oil revenues, about 90% of our revenues have come from oil in the past. And now 70% of our general fund spending is supported by the permanent fund. So we've effectively transitioned to what you would call an endowment state, but we do not have the protections in place to ensure that the endowment functions the way it needs to. And that's the, the, the key thing here. So just for clarification on this slide, when we say general fund spending comes from the permanent fund, it doesn't actually come from the permanent fund so much as from the earnings of the permanent fund. Yeah, it's a little semantic because, and I'll explain this here in a second here. <clears throat> um, the structure of the permanent fund is unique. Uh, yes, 70, it comes from 70% of from the earnings, but we have this sort of unique bifurcated management structure where we have an earnings reserve account where all earnings from the fund flow and all of those are available for appropriation by simple majority. Um, but yeah, I, you're right. From earnings. Okay. I asked some um, bonehead questions just for the record in case someone who's uninitiated watches these videos. Oh, no, it's great. I, this, is, this issue is so complex, it's very difficult to boil it down and make it simple and you know, easy to digest. So I appreciate any clarifications. Um, so a couple other lessons from the past here is that um, It's appropriate, I think, to, to step back and ask, okay, 
how does this all end? <laughs> what can we learn from the last seven years? And what does that indicate about the most likely outcome? And the takeaways uh, for me are, uh, you know, it's really very simple. One, this is uniquely complex. Alaska fiscal politics are more complex than most other states. And so far proved impossible for the legislature, or at least difficult, for the legislature to broker a, brand, a grand compromise on how to close the gap. <clears throat> and what we have tried effectively year after year after year after year after year after year after year is we send a new group down there and they get educated, they debate, they work hard, but in the end, they get high centered on this really complicated discussion and they default to the path of least resistance and that is to spend savings. And it's difficult to argue that we're likely to see different results given the same fundamental constraints on that conversation. And the, the real takeaway is that so long as we leave savings accessible, savings will most likely be used. And we've reached a point where continuing to rely on savings the way we do is going to have very material and irreversible consequences on, on what the state looks like because there's nowhere else to go but the permanent fund and more specifically spending from the permanent fund in a way that is unsustainable, spending more earnings than it can create on an annual basis. <clears throat> and that by default makes spending the permanent fund our default fiscal plan. And <laughs> I, I don't wanna like uh, be sensationalistic here, but um, this will be the fight every year until we make this change. And we are living in this sort of tragedy of the commons because we're hurtling towards this result that no one really wants, but uh, we all sort of feel powerless to prevent because we don't have a vehicle that is so far proved able to drive compromise on these more challenging issues. <clears throat> and uh, I will get to this soon, but this amendment I think can actually be that vehicle. So back to what you mentioned earlier, Jomo, the reason we can spend unsustainably from the permanent fund is because of this unique management structure. It was really a product of political compromise. We have two portions of the fund, one called the corpus that is constitutionally protected and another called the earnings reserve account. And that is where all of the earnings flow. So if you imagine, say we've got a, a strip mall in Arizona that we own and um, as soon as we sell that strip mall, all the earnings from that, anything above what we paid for it goes up into the earnings reserve anytime we realize a gain. And so the, the balance of that fund can go up and down, changes dramatically with uh, market performance. And at times we've had over a third, well, about a third of the entire fund in the earnings reserve, all available for appropriation. So there are a few problems with that. Uh, technical challenges, financial and philosophical. Technical challenges, this is not all that sexy, but the permanent fund did an analysis um, maybe a year ago. And what they did is they looked back at a hundred years and they broke it up into 20 year increments. And they said, okay, if the market performs during the next 20 years, the way it had in these previous 20 year increments, what's the likelihood that we would be unable to get the money out to make our statutory POMV withdrawal under the current structure? And the result was basically 50-50. There's a 50% chance, all else being equal, we will be unable to get the money out that we need to pay for government services and for dividends. And you have to assume <laughs> that with that high a chance, it's, it, you have to assume it's gonna happen. And it's difficult to quantify the, the material impacts of that, but needless to say, it's not good. So <clears throat> the issue I think most people will be familiar with here with unsustainable spending is the simple financial prudence of it. Um, smaller fund, smaller earnings, um, some, 
basic rule of thumb here is that you know, for every billion dollars we spend down today, we're giving up about $50 million in earnings every year forever. And to give that some context, the $17 billion that we've spent over the last seven or eight years, the earnings from that could now pay the dividend in recent years forever. That would no longer be a political issue, but it is. We will live with that. Um, what we're really talking about is doubling down on that approach because we've got $16 billion in the earnings reserve now, all available for appropriation. And if you can imagine this bigger issue that we're dealing with, this, this fiscal struggle, imagine trying to fix it five, six years from now when the fund is spending off $800 million less. So you've effectively got a gap that's 800 million larger. It does not get any easier than it is today. Okay, and third, and this is really, this is the issue that got the, uh, the Institute of the North involved in this whole discussion, is that it's just not our money to spend. We have uh, brought in about $150 million billion in oil revenues since creating the fund. And we've spent the vast majority of that, about 87%, on infrastructure and the needs of the day. And I'm not saying that's bad, but what is bad is the idea of spending the very modest 13% inheritance that we have left to future generations of that oil wealth. Because that the permanent fund was always conceived as a vehicle for taking non-renewable resources, converting them into renewable wealth for us and for all generations of Alaskans. It's not a legacy that I think anybody wants to leave to raid this intergenerational asset. <clears throat> so quick takeaway here is that it does not matter what your philosophy is, your politics, your perspective on life. If you want lower taxes, you want to save the dividend, you want to protect services, Maintaining the real value of the fund is your single best strategy for doing that. Everybody benefits from that. And not only that, it's really our duty to future generations to treat that asset sustainably. And that's why when we touched on this earlier, this idea has been around forever. Here's a, just a, a short list, all I could fit on one slide of uh, some of the uh, resolutions out there. But this does not cover any of the organizations that have um, issued POMV uh, resolutions in the past, which I'm sure you're aware of some. So, Actually, like I before, said, this is, yeah. Before you leave that slide, so a couple of years ago, Mr. Dotson here had me do some research on the establishment of the permanent fund and also the establishment of the dividend program. And so, yes, I hadn't realized that this concept of percent of market value had been around as long as it has. Um, it really, as you noted, uh, the, the very founders of the permanent fund, the first board of trustees uh, had made a recommendation regarding this kind of structure and this kind of uh, payout from the, the permanent portion of the permanent fund. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's, this is not like our idea. We're just trying to get it over the hurdle here. <clears throat> And like I said, this is as much strategy as it is policy, because one thing to keep in mind here is that this fiscal challenge, uh, it, will, it will be resolved someday. We will close the gap. It cannot go on forever, right? But any deal that we broker now is going to be better than any deal we broker five years from now when we have bottomed out the ERA and are forced to make all these uncomfortable changes, but we're doing it in an environment with a smaller fund creating fewer earnings to fill the gap. So we need a deal and we're gonna get that deal by giving Alaska a deadline. And this is one of the key ideas I want you to take away from this is that if we queue up this amendment, we pass it this year or next year, that puts it on the ballot in 2022. 
goes into effect in 2023 or later if we need. But for the first time, once you've got that out there, this is a deadline on the horizon that says, okay, after this point, we're no longer going to allow unstructured draws from the earnings reserve account. And that deadline is what's gonna drive negotiations within the legislature on these other difficult issues in a way that we haven't experienced before. It gives us a few years to figure it out, but we're gonna figure it out. So uh, we are putting together a coalition and this is my pitch to you uh, of organizations across all sectors of the Alaskan economy that are united behind the single goal of protecting the real value of the permanent fund. That is what brings us together. We're agnostic on a lot of the details, namely the dividend. The legislature has to figure that out, but no matter what happens, they need to protect the fund. So we're running sort of a public focused effort. This is a part of that. Um, it's a very soft touch campaign. I'm just getting out and doing education, trying to help people understand the impacts uh, that this will have and the opportunity that we have today to, I don't mean to be like <laughs> too dramatic, but like we're choosing a better future today. If we, if we do this today, then we will be able to in the, in the future. Um, anybody who joins our coalition uh, will have an opportunity to withdraw if they do not think that the makeup of the coalition is sufficiently representative uh, or they're just not comfortable with the makeup of the coalition in the end. And they'll have that opportunity before we go public with our list. Um, and as a member, you uh, are basically committing to being shown on our website and in some communications to the legislature. And we may call on you to write letters, uh, testify in support of bills. Um, and this is in no way a mutually exclusive effort. So if your organization wants to support new revenues or cuts or some other effort that is related, that's fine. You can still be a part of our coalition and say, essentially, hey, no matter what else goes on, do this one thing that we all agree on. I just wanna close by offering one observation broadly on constitutional change. And that is, it is not something to be taken lightly. Uh, and I think a lot of people mistake it uh, or treat it as, like we do the conventional lawmaking process where we rule by majority, we Christmas tree things together. Jomo, you're familiar with this. Uh, we use the levers of politics and this is different. We have to seek a higher bar of consensus here because at the end of the day, the, the, the sacred document we are amending is what speaks to what constitutes us all as Alaskans. And so in the context of the permanent fund, we have to ask, who are we really? Uh, what do we really stand for? Do we really believe in sustaining the future of this state? Are we a generation that's going to deal with our own problems or are we gonna pass the buck? And I think we would all like to answer those the same way, but we are answering those questions one way or another, either through action or inaction. So as you can tell, this is something near and dear to my heart as it is to many, and um, I'll leave it at that. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to present today. Hi. Uh, so please. can you go into a brief explanation of how this would be put forward? Uh, in other words, what would start the process of, of yeah. the actual yeah, that's a great question. Um, constitutional changes require a two-step process. First, what has to happen is a, uh, a joint resolution needs to be passed by the legislature and it has to pass by a two-thirds threshold in both bodies. And that's what I was speaking to earlier that we have three versions of that currently active in the legislature right now. And uh, they debate the language uh, both bodies pass that language and that puts it on the ballot at the next regularly scheduled election. In this case, that would be 2022. But if we miss that window, the next time that it can uh, go before the public for a public vote is 2024, then 2026. So the timing is actually very 
critical here um, because we only have a shot every two years and every year that we put this off, the future becomes a little less bright in Alaska because we start to shrink the fund. Is it, does that clarify the issue? It, it does, uh, it, you know, just, you know, obviously when you think of getting the, uh, both bodies of legislature to vote, uh, two thirds of them to vote uh, and move something forward, uh, you know, the main thing that jumps to mind is problems. <laughs> yeah, it's not easy. I mean, changing the constitution is hard. It's meant to be hard. Um, and this is going to be, I, I think, one of the issues at the center of the debate over the next two years. But it doesn't become easier the more we wait, right? Uh, as anybody who's been involved in politics knows, uh, first year of a cycle is always easier. Second year becomes harder to get anything done. And you, know, you push it out past two years, then you're looking at 2024. Yeah, I, I know it's not an easy thing, but we don't really have a choice but to try, I think. Rich, I see you Rich taking Cyber. yourself off mute. Go ahead, Rich. Yeah, um, I, I, um, I, I respect the idea of the POMV <laughs> and the idea of protecting the fund. The big elephant in the room is the permanent fund dividend. I think the most dangerous things we could do is put the permanent fund dividend into a, a constitutional amendment. And that, that implicitly guarantees it. It implicitly said, in fact, the language of what I've seen is that 50% of it uh, could be uh, go to the permanent fund dividend. It, you know, um, the legislature could do other things to, to lighten the load here. And one of them is to put in place an oil tax, even though it didn't pass the the vote, you know, um, <laughs> we're still under the uh, under the reasonable limit for oil tax to, to get more revenue. Um, but man, putting the permanent fund dividend, that's the hostage game. Putting the permanent fund, you, you listen to any of the testimonies in the legislature uh, in the budgeting process, um, people say, give me my permanent fund dividend and the hell with the rest of it. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah. it's tragic. I mean, it, this is, this is the, the big blackmail game that the public is playing with the legislature and it's hamstringing us. I, I just think the worst possible thing we could do, you don't see any of this in the, in the definitional language of what the permanent fund should be. It shouldn't be established to, to deliver a permanent fund dividend. It's not there for purpose of uses, legitimate uses of the state. That's what the permanent fund is supposed to be for. Um, yeah. Whether you consider the dividend a legitimate use is fine, but you don't put it into the per, into the uh, constitution. I just think that's a tragedy. Well, let's jump up a high, just one step higher level, which is the thorny issue is spending, whatever purpose it might be, but spending. So, would you is Institute of the North advocating uh, for any one of these proposals? Uh, uh, again, would you? Would you prefer or would you rather defer a conversation on spending? Do you mean just general budget spending? Let's just say a clean POMV resolution versus one that uh, is uh, directed regarding how, how the earnings are spent. Yeah. 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 That. <laughs> yeah my answer to that is yes. I was, I was actually asking the, the guest, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> and that's fine, Rich, jump in. Um, <clears throat> we're united just behind the simple message that we need to protect the fund. We're not getting into the discussion around how the legislature choose to dictate spending. But the way that I choose to look at it is um, against the alternative. And so the alternative, Rich, is, okay, we refuse to pass an amendment because it touches on the dividend in some fashion, either requires a dividend or has a formula for a dividend. Um, so we don't do anything to protect the fund. And we, we spend down the ERA, we have a smaller fund. Is that result better 
than the alternative where you have protected the fund, but you've also protected uh, a dividend payment. Um, because if you look at like, okay, what, what are the impacts of that then? So you've constitutionalized a dividend. Let's say you have the most uh, aggressive dividend formula where you're saying 50-50 split. So now you've made the issue bigger in a way because you've taken this revenue source and required that half of it be spent to dividends. So what are you going to do to fix the remainder of this issue? And there are a lot of ideas out there about how to address that. Do you implement uh, a clawback tax where it is essentially a, an income tax structure to target the sort of flat tax that targets the dividend? Um, or is it something more progressive? I don't know. Um, it's very difficult to, to anticipate specifically what the outcome would be, but I think in the, in the net, I think we're going to be in a better spot if we protect the fund almost no matter what. In reality, I don't think anybody thinks that a 50-50 split is gonna go through the legislature. Even the governor's starting point for this discussion, and you know his, his politics, uh, began with the proposal to constitutionalize the POMV, constitutionalize entitlement to a dividend, but to leave that formula to statute for the legislature to figure out. Um, so I, I don't think even he necessarily thinks a 50-50 split is feasible given the politics uh, in the legislature today. But I appreciate where you're coming from. So just to uh, give everybody a heads up, because this is a particularly opportune moment to say so, our guest next week is going to be Mr. Cliff Grow. He's a former special mm -hmm. assistant to the Commissioner of the Department of Revenue, um, where we're going to discuss uh, these thornier spending issues and revenue issues. Um, so, so make sure you put that hat on for next week. Rich, if you have follow-up, you can go ahead and take yourself off mute. Otherwise, we do have uh, former Senator Gary Wilkin. Um, Gary, you, I'm sure you have some insights on the politics of how this might go and, and how we might actually get something through. But Rich, I see you're off mute. You can fire away. Well, I just, I just uh, would like to ask what happens if you put the permanent fund dividend and the a POMV in place, and you have once one, those one of those fifty percent chance years of uh, no gain in the permanent fund um, and no earnings for that year. Um, you know, it happened in two thousand eight. We mm -hmm. lost almost thirty yeah. percent of the value of the permanent fund uh, in two thousand eight. Um, what happens? What do you do? So, yeah. So I, this is, I didn't explain this detail, but the way this is actually calculated is that the 5% POMV is calculated as 5% uh, of the average of the fund's value over the first five of the preceding six years. A little wordy, but it essentially means that it's 5% averaged over the last five years. Um, so you can deal with fluctuations in the market, both up and down, without running into that sort of uh, problem. Um, and it also actually does make the effective rate, assuming the, the fund is actually growing, the effective rate is actually a little bit smaller than 5%. It's more like four and a half. Gary. Does that make sense? No. <clears throat> yes, sir. Senator Wilkin. Yeah, yeah, well, good morning. Uh, Gary works just fine. Thank you. And uh, Rich and I agree on about two of every 10 things. So, <laughs> so, but I certainly agree with him on his uh, take on putting it into the, into the uh, constitution. The chances of that happening are not only, are nil and none. So we can just dispense with that just because of the politics. But let me just say, uh, Ian and, and you and I served together some years ago when you first started down in uh, La La Land. Do you remember me? Yeah. Yeah, oh, sure. And, uh, um, just a couple of comments. I joined a little bit late. A couple of comments. I, I'm, um, I, I'm just. Um, I remain just shocked about how we refuse to recognize the fact that we have seventy-five billion dollars in the bank. We have seven hundred and thirty-five thousand people that that's built to benefit. 
that we are, uh, according to a permanent fund study, uh, a white paper that's still on their website, um, but simple calculation takes Alaska to one of the richest sovereigns in the nation, uh, in the world, pardon me. Yeah. Uh, back in 2008, we were number seven in the world. Um, yet we refuse to recognize um, our wealth. And, and you said it a number of times, and I, I just have to jump up and correct you. We are not spending down the earnings reserve. Uh, if, if one goes to the permanent fund summary sheet that's on their website and updated every day, you'll see a, with a 10 year look back and a 10 year look forward that we essentially are putting in almost as much as we take out. So people have yeah. a tendency to confuse the CBR with the ERA. The CBR, when it's spent, is spent, and it's and it is definitely going away, and it should go away. It's a terrible budgeting tool, but that's in the weeds. the The fact of the matter is, is that the earnings reserve is there for us to spend. And I would ask you, Ian, um, bef before you get too far down the track here, I would ask for you to be able to answer a simple question. Let me ask you this: If I ask you, uh, what is the effect in for the next five years? of taking $2 billion a year out of the earnings reserve. What is the effect in that five years on the permanent fund check, on the earnings reserve balance, and on the corpus of the permanent fund balance? You should be able to answer that. I answered it in 2008, and it is shocking at the, the resiliency of the earnings reserve. And I would ask yeah. you, because I think that's part and parcel of your presentation, you can't say we're spending down the, the earnings reserve without saying what the effect of that is. So that's a piece that's missing. Let me just say one more thing and then I'm gonna shut up. The PMV, when Frank Burkowski rolled it out in early, in early 2000s, the problem with the PMV is that it's automatic spending. It actually drives up spending rather than keeps, puts a lid on it. Because you know every year when your budgeting process starts, you're going to get X amount off of the PM, POMV. There's no lid to that other than the value of the fund. So that's built in and you're gonna take it whether you need it or not. If oil goes to 150 and we have some of those glory years and we don't need, we don't need anything out of the earnings reserve, we still got that POMV and it essentially drives spending. So that's, that's one of the components that really is troubling with the POMV. So with that, thank you, Joe, for throwing me into the, into the mosh pit. But uh, I'm, I'm glad I had a chance. And Ian, I, uh, I sent you some time ago a spreadsheet on the effect of the earnings reserve, given the scenarios that I just handed to you. And I'd be more than happy to go over that with you again, because I think it's a critical component to rec that we don't recognize the wealth that we have in our state. And we're almost ashamed to, rec it's ashamed to admit it. So thank you for being here. And I look forward to uh, Cliff's presentation next, uh, next uh, week. Thanks. Thanks, Shoma. Yeah, thank you so much. And if you could, if you could resend that, I, I don't recall receiving it, but I'd, I'd love to take a look. And we'll you're 100% right. We are not spending down the earnings reserve today. Um, and what we're really talking about is, you know, we do use the earnings reserve. We're not spending it down. What this is really focused on is the long-term risk that we do start to spend more than is sustainable. So to get into your $2 billion question, the question is, what's the effect of us spending $2 billion from the earnings reserve hard stop? That would be great. Uh, we would be in a good, the fund can more than sustain that. The question is whether we take the, say sustainable amount of the earnings that we could spend from the fund and then spend more than that. We're not doing it yet, but we could do it. Um, and it's a likely thing to happen over the next couple of few years until we find some po point of equilibrium. Um, but this is more forward looking. We're not doing it today. So thanks for allowing me to clarify. And I will send you those things. Uh, thanks, Ian. Nice yeah, to thanks see so much. You. So I have a question. Um, okay, so this is my understanding. At the onset of the oil price crisis, uh, the Walker administration essentially looked across all of the savings accounts of the state of Alaska and essentially put a dollar for, or quantified it um, and basically had a, a, a general premise 
Uh, they, I want to say that they looked up and, you know, between the uh, statutory budget reserve at the time, the constitutional budget reserve, the permanent fund, the different sub accounts of the general fund, um, that there was somewhere around, I don't know, 80, 85 billion dollars of total value at the time. And to essentially roll all of that into one earnings, one earning bearing account, essentially the permanent fund, and that would be the basis of the POMB would be the earnings of the total savings of the state of Alaska. Right now, as you noted, we have a bifurcated permanent fund. When you say $74 billion, is that just the permanent portion of the permanent fund or is that the permanent oh. plus? That's the whole thing, uh, permanent whole fund thing. plus it's, it's generated earnings. Yeah. Under any of these POMB structures, uh, resolutions, are we talking about taking essentially eliminating the ERA, there's just the permanent fund. We take 5% of that total 74 billion value and that's what becomes available for spending. Yes, all of them. They the, all earnings reserve, the earnings reserve goes away. Okay, because that's, that's a critical point. Um, uh, I'll make a note of that, yeah, it's a good point. Are there yeah, any the risks to what is the risk once you've eliminated the barrier between a spendable portion of the, uh, you know, but essentially when you've eliminated the checking account and it really is just all the, well, excuse me, you've eliminated the savings account and it really is one big checking account. Well, I would say that it's one big savings account, then it's not, and it kind of depends on your perspective, but the risk is that you can't spend it. So it depends on if your priority is access to money or your priority is to prioritize savings. Um, and when you get rid of the ERA, you treat it as an endowment and you're limited to uh, a sustainable draw, uh, you no longer have that risk that you're going to start to eat away at the, the golden goose, so to speak. But, okay. um, but you don't have access to the money, right? Another question is how we define um real real value regarding the permanent fund um sen uh, former senator wilkin would know that uh quite a bit of the money that we used to get spun off into the era would be put back into the permanent fund as inflation proofing yeah this um is there still a mechanism to make sure that the real value of the savings account is maintained and or mm -hmm. grows yeah, inflation proofing is built into the endowment model. So if you look at the money that makes up the permanent fund today, it, you know, the original formula is we're going to take 25% of all of our royalties, and that's what's going to build up the permanent fund. Well, the majority, the largest single contributor to the fund's value now is inflation proofing. It's not royalties. Um, and that was necessary because the protected portion of the fund does not grow with inflation at all. So over time, if it were all else remained the same, the real value would erode. And the legislature had, in, during good times, uh, the discipline of artificially inflation proofing by taking earnings and putting them in the protected portion of the fund. So <clears throat> what happens under the new constitutional structure or the new POMV structure is that the 5% or four and a half, what, you know, let's call it 5%, is what is projected to uh, be sustainable and allow the real value of the fund to at least sustain over time, meaning that it's growing at at least the pace of inflation um, and hopefully allow the fund to grow. But it is, um, well, that, that's the basic answer. But inflation well, proofing I, is built into that. You no longer need to make those. Sorry, go ahead. Historically, an average, I want to say what the fund has earned, somewhere like six and a half, seven, somewhere between mm -hmm. six and a half and eight percent per annum. Yeah, it, yeah, it's about that, six and a half. Okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to throw out too much. Technical garbly gook. Uh, so we have someone off mute. Eight, excuse me, nine eight two six nine three one. Yeah, I was. Um, I, you know, this, this discussion about the constitutional um, 
enshrining the, the dividend in the Constitution, I think, is the only way you're going to do anything like this. Um, I was a kid when Jay Hammond put together the permanent fund, and I remember, you know, I believe his position was he wanted 50% of royalties to go into the permanent fund because he didn't trust the legislature with it. I think that that has been borne out, and that's the problem that you have with coming up with one of these, with anything that taps into the permanent fund, so far as the people are concerned. It's fine for academicians and um, and and legislators want to say we need more money, but the legislature has a horrendous history of misspending funds. And I think that there's, there's just a total lack of trust by the uh, Alaskan people about it. Um, they're saying, well, we need this money, and you can trust us to spend it wisely, and you just go back and look at the history, and they haven't done that. I, I, I think about the $900 million oil tax settlement that they spent in one day. And so I think that, that you know, if you're going to go forward with this, there has to be some kind of constitutional guarantee for a dividend, otherwise the people aren't going to buy it. And may I ask who this is? David Peace. Oh, hey, sir. I will tell you that Bert Stedman would argue that they've actually shown pretty good prudence. There was a reason why there were, what, up to $17 billion in the statutory budget reserve and the constitutional budget reserve to dip into. Um, but uh, yeah, your, your, point is, uh, your point is not lost on this group. Mr. Wilkin, I see that you're off mute again. Oh, <laughs> uh, now you put yourself on mute, Gary. Gary, you, you put yourself on mute. He's on a roll. <laughs> Gary? Here I am. I, I, I don't want to dominate, but I, I don't want, I, I, I want to go back to the inflation proofing issue. Uh, Ian, uh, respectfully, um, when the fund yeah. grows 6.4% as it has over the last 10 years, uh, that's 6.4% on everything all in. So, um, um, this notion, like we did last year, spent $1.1 billion in precious uh, UGF money in order to inflation-proof a fund that was earning 8.4, but the but Federal Reserve tells us that the inflation rate for that for the year was 1.6. I, for the life of me, do not understand why we inflation-proof with precious GF dollars when the fund is outperforming the market by, by a, a, a factor of four. <laughs> We pay four or $500 million a year for the best people in the world that clamor to manage our fund. And if they don't perform, they're out the door and they know it. And the results of that is a, is a world-class sovereign wealth fund. Yeah. So the thought that you have to pull out, and indeed we pulled out last year, we forward funded inflation proofing, how that ever got through. Mm -hmm. When we're clamoring for school dollars and for ferry dollars and for infrastructure dollars, we're doing something to make us feel good, something called inflation proofing. So don't fall for it that we are uh, have to put more money into inflation proofing when indeed the fund itself is outperforming the market and has outperformed the market every, almost every year since its inception. So uh, thank you, Jomo, and I'm going to quit getting off of mute. <laughs> No, it's your comments are always uh, appreciated, Gary, um, and yours too, Rich. Everyone here. Um, just so uh, I'm clear, uh, so we still though make deposits from resource revenues into the fund that hasn't stopped. Yeah, it's it's shrunk over time. Yeah, constitutionally, at least twenty five percent of mineral rents and royalties go into the permanent fund. And that, of course, is shrinking with uh, lower production. It's a uh, you know, consistent one-eighth of the uh, value of the barrel oil. Um, so that's contributed less and less over time to the value. And what's contributed more and more are these ad hoc deposits uh, from the earnings to the principal that um, Senator Wilkins was talking about um, under the guise of inflation proofing. And um, you know, we call it inflation proofing, but I, I think particularly last year, it was a, a, just a mechanism to try to protect the money. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with Senator Wilkins. Okay, but again, under any of these uh, proposed amendments, it, again, it, it has diminished over time, the amount of uh, those mineral revenues um, but it still would, does happen. It's still constitutional that a portion does yep. go. And that, that will not change. That'll continue to be the case. It's at times increased. I know it's, it's via statute, it's been increased at times to 50% of mineral royalties uh, or yeah, rent and royalties. 
Um, but it's required under the statute, 25%. That won't change. Jomo, could I, cur could I add to that, please? Because I think it's an important yeah. point, Ian. Um, th th that's not quite correct. Um, when we say, as our constitution says, that we'll deposit 25%, uh, you have to complete that sentence now because of federal legislation back in, in the early 80s, except for NPRA. NPRA, we do not get that 25%. It, it goes first to six impacted villages on the North Slope, and then it comes to the permanent fund. So that's a subject for a whole nother day. But uh, the thought that uh, NPRA uh, contributes just as <laughs> Safer Bay is not correct uh, because of federal legislation. Um, the other thing is uh, we're pumping about 500,000 barrels a day. We pumped at 500,000 barrels a day, plus or minus say uh, 50,000 barrels for the last 12 years. So, um, and we've got huge prospects ahead. Oil is still oil and it's still valuable regardless of how you feel about it. So our future is very bright. And again, that leads back to the PUMV. We can develop three Nunachucks and we're still gonna get that automatic dump. Uh, in, in, in spite of the fact we're getting more and more from all the work that's being done to develop these uh, these fields. So I just wanted to add that, add that as, yeah. uh, as a, a, a bit of a correction, Ian, so please be aware of that. No, no it's, uh, it's a great point. Yeah, I'm trying to oversimplify things, but yeah, that's, that's correct. Rich, I see you've taken yourself <laughs> off mute. Yeah, Gary, I wish we'd fully tax it. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> If, if you guys want to come here to the boardroom table and arm wrestle, yep. you're more than welcome. Uh, <laughs> well, Rich, Rich, all you need is 21 and 11. Ian, while we still have a couple of minutes uh, before the very top of the hour, again, you, so you did mention there are several, or at least three of these constitutional amendments. Um, and you also said that you'd be testifying soon. Can you go ahead and let us know so folks could, could know where to tune in and when? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I'll be testifying in front of Ways and Means um, at 1130 today. Uh, so you can get the link via uh, the, the legislature's homepage or link to the um, live broadcast and you can pull it up that way. Yes. So anyone, if you just uh, Google Alaska legislature, when you get to the home page, you'll see a series of tabs uh, really front and center in the middle of the page. At 11 a.m., you can just go ahead and click on the far right to watch live, and House Ways and Means should be there on the drop down list if anyone would like to watch. You can also uh, get information on how to testify when, when public testimony comes up. Well, okay, well, we're, uh, we still have another minute or two uh, before the very top of the hour. Again, do we have any further comments? Clark, I see you tuned in. Yes, sir. And it's lovely having been a bit late as well to wish I had been earlier. Um, it strikes me, I, I tend to agree with Gary on the particular point that I don't think we'll be able to get the constitutional uh, process because of the politics. I wish we could. Um, and I think we have to prepare for what can and will happen since we we can't, not can't, won't end up walking that path. I'm still fearful for this year's legislature and I hope we can. I, I also agree with Gary, we need to take into account, uh, and I agree with Ian on a number of points. Um, it's scary how divided our public is and therefore our legislators, our servants struggle and um, having sidebars would probably help if only we could get there. Comment on my part, Joe Citizen. Good comment, good comments, Clark Citizen. All right, well, Ian, again, we're here at the very top of the hour. Any final thoughts? No, I think we've, we've covered it all in pretty good detail. Um, you know, I would just close, I guess, with my main point with which is that you know, protecting the value of the fund is gonna be the cornerstone of the state's future. And uh, we're gonna be better off if we protect it. Um, we're better off doing it sooner than later. Uh, so no matter what else happens in the legislative discussion, 
uh, we at Institute think this has got to be the priority. Um, but in addition to being uh, good policy, it's good strategy and perhaps the only strategy for actually driving resolution of this, this bigger issue. So, um, you know, if we would love for uh, your organization to join our coalition um, and to call your legislators and let them know that this is uh, a priority for you as well. And thanks again for the time. All right. Well, Mr. Lang, thank you so much again. Uh, Thank you very, uh, Mr. Lang, Executive Director of the Institute of the North. Uh, again, much appreciated. Just so everyone knows, with just one more reminder, we do have a guest lined up for next week. It's Mr. Cliff Grow, again, Special Forum Assistant to the Commissioner of Revenue. Um, actually, he was part of uh, many of the discussions regarding uh, the permanent fund, the dividend, um, and uh, he, we are gonna have him as a guest as we start to, well, have a discussion regarding some of those spending and revenue issues. Um, that really aren't part of this discussion. Again, this is more about uh, protecting the permanence of the permanent fund moving forward so it can serve as uh, a source of funds for those bigger spending discussions. You can only spend what you got, um, certainly in this state. So everyone, thank you so much for being here and uh, have a great week and we'll see you next Tuesday. All right, thank you. Thanks, Trimble. Thanks, Ian.